You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul explains that when something is mentioned only once in Scripture, it's a good indication that we should pay attention. I am delighted to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. We have something interesting in verse 27. But Laban said to him, If you will allow me to say so, I have learned by divination which is a lengthy translation of a verb in the Pi'al whose root is exactly the same as Nahash which is the name of this animal in 3.1 that we refer to as serpent. So there is no way unless you hear it in Hebrew Or in English, you have to wait, way down, until you hear that divination in the Bible is not a good thing. You should not divine. And I'm going to mention to you a few texts here. But if you know Hebrew already, you hear the ominousness. And ominous comes from omen. It's bad news for you. And listen to the rest. I have learned by divination, Nihashti, that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages, which is Sakar, and I will give it to you. But the funny thing is that in the rest of the story, Jacob is going to fool Laban. So you could see how the text in the original is set up to tell you that Laban did a bad thing by trying divination to figure out. It didn't work. And Let me mention to you, I have these here a series of texts for us to really be convinced of the function of this root Nahash. In Genesis 44, 4 to 6, a series of texts. When they had gone but a short distance from the city, Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you returned evil for good? Why have you stolen my silver cup? You know the story that he had his servants put it in the bag of one of his brothers. Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he divines? Notice. But this is a reference to Joseph as being the prime minister of Pharaoh. Meaning, This is how things are done in the palaces of the Gentile kings and, as we shall see, also the Israelite and Judahite kings. And Joseph repeats, What deed is that that you have done? Do you not know that such a man as I can indeed divine again as the prime minister? But earlier, when he understood the dreams, You don't have the use of that verb, the verb Nihash, from the root Nahash. In Leviticus 19.26, we have it very clearly, You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it, you shall not practice augury or witchcraft. And in the Hebrew, Lo tokelu al haddam, Lo there you hear the verb which is translated as practice augury 
A third text here, we have it in Deuteronomy 18.10, very quickly. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination. Deuteronomy 18.10 But in Isaiah chapter 8, we have a text that is very interesting, which is the beginning of scripturalizing the oral message. Let's hear it. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? You don't have here the root Nahash, but you have definitely the thought that you're going to mediums and wizards to get the info. But then the text invites you to say no to the teaching and to the testimony which I have left with my disciples. Surely for this word which they speak there is no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed or hungry, and when they are hungry they will be enraged and will curse their king and their god and turn their faces upward, and they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Very beautiful, the end of chapter 8. Meaning, remember, what I'm saying to you applies to the future, because it has been written in a scroll of testimony. That's the text to which I refer as the beginning of Scripture, which will be developed in Jeremiah by having the Lord putting his words in the mouth of Jeremiah, and then the culmination in a scroll already written in heaven and handed down to Ezekiel. So, obviously, again, as I say, one has to wait, but it's good in my presentations to show my hearers the real intention of the original words. And then you know how Jacob tries to fool his father-in-law by stealing the sheep and the lambs. And you have an irony here, he says, so my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. The interesting thing is that Jacob is using a very important word here, which is translated my honestly, softly. You know, it's irritating. The RSV is definitely irritating. Okay. He uses sadaqa, which means of being righteous, correct, while he was not. But the hearer has been prepared for that. In the story of how he, with the help of his mother, stole the erdum and the blessing from his brother Esau. So Jacob is systematically the bad guy and you should not be amazed because later in the prophets Israel and Judah are always the bad guys you know there is nothing new under the sun in scripture in this sense and the last verse is also intentionally tricky thus the man which is Jacob grew exceedingly rich and had large flocks, maid servants and men servants, and camels and asses, but you, the hearer, realize that it was through his cunning, and it had nothing to do with the blessing coming from God. But for me to convince my fellow theologians, 
or Christians or believers, whether Jews or Christians, you know, it's practically impossible because in their mind, our forefathers cannot be bad guys. Whereas, I know you heard it time again, by now you have guessed, Father Paul is going again to remind us of the first eight verses of Psalm 78. I have no choice but to do that because it comes again and again in the story. Let's continue with chapter 21 and we shall find a series of interesting things and I'm going to comment on words. The important thing is to remember that the background is always shepherdism. Okay, you have the lambs, you have the flock, you have the camels and so on. But against this background the author is already throwing at you how Jacob is preparing for the future of stones and buildings and pillars. We already heard about that earlier when he promised the Lord God who appeared to him to build for him. Already you have a mention of a stone there. But here it is developed, which again is anchoring in your mind that Jacob is a far cry of being the good guy. Okay, the good guy is Isaac because he didn't do much. He didn't have the opportunity to do bad things. Abraham is halfway. He is already a prefigure of Jacob and Jacob will bring it to its maximum and that's why he will be punished for 430 years in Egypt, he and his children. Now, as I keep repeating, and you could hear this, like we the readers cannot be Abraham because Abraham is our father the way Adam is our father. We can be only Jacob, Israel. And this goes way into down the New Testament. But as I stress, on the basis of what Paul said in Galatians, we are children kata Isaac ala Isaac. And thus my conclusion is that you are Jacob, you cannot do anything about it, otherwise the scripture is not functioning for you. But I say that you have to be Jacob, son of Abraham, vada Isaac. And that, as we shall see, is the importance at the hand of the author of repeating always the God of Abraham and of Isaac, my father. Here again, why not just Abraham? Because we know that if he's the God of Abraham, he's also the God of Isaac. But in the text, and we're going to meet a couple of ways referring to Isaac that are very important. And thus my conclusion is that there is a missing link between us as Jacobites, the children of Jacob or the children of Israel, in our connection with Abraham, that it has to go through Isaac. And it's frustrating because Abraham is a big deal in Scripture. Isaac is not a big deal out of Genesis. <laughs> so saying we are the children of Abraham and it is reflected in the statement of Jesus in the New Testament, God can make out of this own children of Abraham. But scripture is scripture and Genesis is Genesis. We have to listen to it to really capture the importance of later statements an example of which is once in the entire Bible 
We are children. Kata Isaac, Allah Isaac, in Galatians chapter 4. But it is central. Again, remember the quantity in Scripture is important because it draws your attention. But something that is mentioned only once, like the fatherhood of God in Ephesians and at the beginning of 2 Corinthians, it's important. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.